السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام شو ستارت Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Stan Lamro. We'll be with you, inshallah, today. Today, our academic activity will include three sessions. The first is uh, PGA and uh, vascular uh, rings by Dr. Uh, Lulit uh, Meti. Second is uh, subaortic membrane by Dr. Uh, Shadal Mutlaq. Third will be surgery in, uh, for adult congenital heart disease by me, inshallah. So, uh, Let's start. Dr. Walid, you can start. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so my topic today is going to be uh, BDA and uh, vascular rings. Uh, the first uh, half, we'll discuss uh, BDA. <clears throat> So uh, first of all, uh, since we're gonna discuss vascular rings, uh, we're gonna go over the aortic arch uh, derivatives later on in that second lecture. But just uh, to start with this uh, lecture, the BDA usually arises from the dorsal portion of the sixth arch. Uh, we'll go into further details in the embryology for the aortic derivatives. So let's uh, talk now about the anatomy or of the BDA. Uh, usually, the BDA is located in the lesser curvature of the uh, <coughs> of the distal aortic arch. Uh, it's usually opposite uh, uh, and distal to the origin of the left subclavian arch, as shown in this illustration. Uh, it, and the insertion site it inserts the uh, proximal LBA, uh, usually just adjacent to the pulmonary bifurcation. <coughs> Yeah, now, the anatomy especially in the presence of uh, right aortic uh, origin insertion of the uh, ductus. <laughs> Most of the, uh, of the times, the uh, ductus arteriosus arises from the left anominate artery and inserts into the uh, region uh, in the uh, LBA in such cases. Uh, other times, it can be uh, arising from the right subclavian and inserts uh, near the uh, proximal RPA. And in very rare instances, there is bilateral ductus arteriosus, and uh, usually that's accompanied by uh, more complex uh, congenital cardiac anomalies. <clears throat> now, in, uh, this uh, illustration is showing uh, the uh, uh, relation of the ductus to surrounding structures. So just posterior to the ductus, <clears throat> uh, we can find the uh, main bronchus. And anterior to it, uh, or anterior to the ductus, it's crossed by the vagus nerve, uh, which gives off the recurrent, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is an important structure, especially uh, when considering the Now, this is, uh, <clears throat> now if you go look into the BDA, there is a classification. And this classification is uh, mostly, it's angiographic uh, classification made uh, uh, by, by people who initially tried to repair uh, percutaneously. In the original uh, classification, there were only five uh, subsets. However, uh, modified uh, Kirchenko classification includes another uh, subset that is uh, that is termed F. So, going over the classification, the first uh, type, which, which is type A, this is conical with the narrowest portion at the pulmonary artery side. <clears throat> Uh, conical meaning that it, the shape is like a cone. So the biggest diameter is B in the aortic side and the narrowest is B at the pulmonary side. Uh, type B, this is a short uh, with narrow aortic, uh, sh uh, short BDA with a narrow insertion side of B from the aortic insertion. Uh, type C, <clears throat> this is tubular with without constrictions. Uh, type D, uh, it has multiple constrictions, uh, usually at the aortic and the pulmonary sites. Uh, 
uh, with a white center. This gives uh, a secular uh, appearance. The, uh, usually the ductus is elongated and uh, narrow at the, uh, or with a constriction at the pulmonary side. Uh, now there is the uh, last uh, subset or called F type or fetal type. Ductus here, here is usually, uh, uh, this is usually found in premature infants uh, that are presenting for catheter closure. It's usually white, torturous, uh, and uh, at times uh, toward the pulmonary side, uh, the ductus may angle and it may resemble a hockey stick. So, and you can hear and see in uh, all the presentations uh, uh, accompanied by a geographic illustration as well. So when talking about the debat physiology or, or normally in, uh, uh, for the uh, ductus, uh, during fetal life, we all know that the pulmonary vascular resistance is very high. So in the presence of DBDA and, uh, 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 the, sorry, the ductus atriosus and the foramen ovale, uh, this allows the blood that is coming to the right side of chamber to bypass the pulmonary circulation. Going through these uh, shunts, it goes to the systemic circulation. Uh, and majority of the blood flows from the ductus arteriosus to the uh, left side. Now, during fetal life, the vacancy of the ductus is regulated by two uh, uh, things. The first is hypoxia and second circulating prostaglandin. Uh, the prostaglandin in particular is secreted by the placenta. So after birth, with the contraction of the spiral muscles that are within the ductus, uh, this will lead to obliteration of the lumen. <clears throat> uh, and also another thing, with the cessation of the circulating prostaglandin, it is since the baby is separated from the placenta, uh, and with the accompanied uh, uh, increase in uh, oxygen saturation, this all, all lead to uh, obliteration of the lumen. Now, all of this process usually takes place within 24 hours after birth. Uh, and further cellular proliferation, which results usually into permanent closure of the ductus, usually this takes uh, from two to three weeks. Now, with the presence, now, if you have uh, any issues with this normal uh, process, uh, this will lead to uh, vacancy of the ductus arteriosus. And, uh, in, uh, and in premature infants in particular, this will lead to a few problems. Uh, first, pulmonary circulation, this will lead to pulmonary edema and resulting uh, need for mechanical ventilation, as we will discuss later. It will also result into uh, left-sided uh, chamber dilations and pulmonary steel. Pulmonary steel is believed to uh, be one of the culprits uh, of one of the complications that it may occur to breed mature infants, uh, namely uh, necrotizing uh, and colitis. Uh, also, one thing of note, the BDA is uh, thought to be associated with increase incidence of intracranial hemorrhage, pulmonary hemorrhage, and focal pulmonary dysplasia and premature infants. So clinical presentation, presentation it's variable. It depends on the age of the patient and the uh, exact pathology from the shunt. So on premature infants, uh, it may lead to increased requirement of mechanical ventilation and to give me a, uh, an examination, you may find a heart murmur. Uh, the murmur is uh, typically heard at the left intraclavicular region and or uh, upper uh, left sternopause, and it is usually uh, described as machinery-like murmur, and that is continuous throughout systole and diastole. In term infants, uh, children, or even adults, uh, patients usually present with. Uh, especially if it's a large shunt, it, it presents with recurrent respiratory infections, tachypnea, or feeding intolerance, uh, and uh, infants, uh, bore weight gain, murmur as described earlier, with widened uh, pulse pressure. 
diagnosis is mainly uh, through uh, an echo. And as we can see here, uh, so uh, in this view, we can see the main pulmonary artery with a bifurcation of the left and uh, uh, right pulmonary artery. And as we said before, the BDA usually inserts into the LBA, uh, just uh, proximal to the bifurcation. Uh, this is the descending uh, aorta, and we can see the BDA connecting the two. Here's uh, hopefully a clear illustration. Uh, now, uh, through uh, echo, usually we need to measure a few important parameters, especially when we're considering uh, BDA. <clears throat> usually these include uh, first ductal characteristics. Uh, so three main parameters and within them, there are a lot of uh, extra details. Uh, the first very important parameter is ductal characteristic. And here you're looking for the duct size, uh, the flow velocity across the BDA, the direction of the shunt, whether it's left or right, and uh, uh, whether the duct is baited or not. Another parameter you're looking for is pulmonary hyperperfusion and the systemic hyperperfusion with the reversal flow uh, through the descending. Uh, <clears throat> these are all uh, only pertinent to the BDA itself. However, you can also assess other aspects of the heart uh, through an echo if there is any accompanying uh, anomalies. Uh, other imaging modalities that can be used, uh, you can use CT, MRI, but they are re rarely necessary. And cardiac cath uh, is another modality that may be needed, but uh, uh, yeah, not all the time. It's usually uh, important if you, uh, if you need measurement of the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, and to check for vasoreactivity, especially if you're trying to determine whether the PDA is gonna uh, if the BDA can be closed or not. <clears throat> so BDA closure and premature infants is uh, a very controversial area. Um, from center to center, you'll find different criteria for closure. Uh, we'll not discuss all the details of the uh, BDA management in premature infants. However, BDA in adults, uh, it's more clear and there are already established criteria uh, guidelines for the closure. Uh, so these are the guidelines that are uh, found in the adult congenital diseases back in 2008. Uh, there are newer guidelines which we will discuss uh, later. But in here, uh, uh, if the BDA is large and symptomatic, this is class one. If it's accompanied by any complications such as endocarditis, this is also class one. Now, if the BDA is asymptomatic, uh, we'll also uh, look into the pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension. The patient has BH with left to right shunting. It may uh, be closed as the, uh, and the recommendation is class 2A. Uh, in the past, they used to also uh, recommend to close it with a device if the BDA is small and asymptomatic. Now with the newer guidelines, uh, there are a few changes. Here they focus on parameters more. Uh, so if there's any LV volume overload uh, without uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, BDA is recommended regardless of the symptoms, whether the patient is symptomatic or not. And the main modality of closure, it's uh, device closure. Now in patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, you look to their pulmonary vascular resistance, whether it's uh, more than five or three to five. Uh, uh, and depending on that, uh, you'll have different uh, classes of recommendations. Now, if there is uh, any patients with BDA and Eisenmenger physiology, uh, it's not recommended uh, to close. Uh, <clears throat> if the BDA is a uh, closure is indicated. It can be a the closure can be accomplished through multiple uh, modalities. Uh, you can close it medically with catheter or surgical ligation. Uh, medical management is usually preserved uh, for uh, <clears throat> a premature infant uh, as it's effective in that uh, uh, 
population, however infirm or older infants, it's usually not effective. This is that's that's why it's not recommended. Uh, medical management is usually uh, achieved through given either prostaglandin synthesis uh, inhibitors or brixidase uh, inhibitors. So the medications within these classes for the prostaglandin we have indomethacin, ibuprofen. Uh, and the, the closure is usually uh, confirmed after the administration of these medications uh, after 24 or 48 hours uh, with an echo. Now, there are contraindications to giving some of these medications. So for the prostaglandin inhibitors, <clears throat> some of the contraindications include active bleeding, whether that is intracranial or gastrointestinal, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, with or without coagulation defects, necrotizing anterior colitis, <clears throat> significant impairment of renal function, and uh, obviously congenital heart disease where the latency of the, of the duct is needed. As far as the surgical management goes, uh, the BDA is usually, can be usually like gated through a thoracotomy. <clears throat> Uh, how, you, but division and oversewing can be used as a, an alternative uh, technique. Uh, during surgery, uh, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, as mentioned before, is encircling with the duct, so care must be taken not to injure it. <clears throat> uh, there are newer techniques that can be used. Uh, if, I'm talking about the uh, uh, video assisted uh, uh, or minimally invasive surgery or, or closure of the PTA. It's a safe uh, and reproducible technique, especially in experienced hands. <clears throat> Other alternative um, techniques or modalities, uh, as mentioned, uh, the PTA can be closed, especially in older adults. Uh, it can be closed with a, a catheter-based intervention, whether it be it a device uh, closure or uh, through embolization. So that's uh, the end of the first section of uh, the presentation. So now, <clears throat> talking about vascular rings, uh, the content of this presentation will go over the definition of uh, the meaning of vascular rings, uh, anatomy and the biology, and uh, discussion of uh, the different types of vascular rings, uh, but physiology will include the presentation, and lastly we'll end up with uh, diagnosis and management. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by vascular rings? Uh, vascular rings are usually defined as congenital malformation, uh, where we have one uh, uh, or more uh, of different vascular structures that encircle the trachea or uh, the esophagus. These vascular structures in particular, these are uh, the aorta or one of its major branches or pulmonary trunk and uh, one of its major branches, uh, as well as the arterial duct or its remnant. And uh, we, because of this large uh, definition, we have multiple uh, variations to the formation of this uh, vascular rings, and we'll try to go through uh, most important uh, ones. <clears throat> So now let's discuss the anatomy. First off, I want to start with uh, trying to define 
what is left ortikash and uh, what is in right ortikash. Uh, left ortikash, usually the, in left ortikash, uh, the arch crosses over the left main stem bronchus and it typically descends along the left side of the spine. And right sided ortikash, uh, uh, the arch crosses uh, above the uh, right main stem bronchus and sent uh, to the right side of the spine. Uh, and, uh, how, rarely, however, it can cross to the retro, in uh, retroesophageal uh, fa uh, fashion and uh, cross uh, and descend uh, to the left of the spine. Now going through the embryology. <clears throat> uh, the embryology of the aortic ash derivative uh, can be quite uh, complex. We'll go over the uh, diff uh, different arch derivatives and the different uh, arches. Usually the aortic, uh, we have six aortic arches, however, a uh, few of them regress uh, during fetal life. And uh, we end up with uh, others that uh, usually form the adult uh, vasculature. So going uh, through the order, usually, uh, the first and the second, they regress uh, during fetal life. However, the remnants uh, are the maxillary and stibial uh, for the first and the second. Uh, the third usually gives rise to the right common carotid uh, with part of the internal carotid and external carotid arch. The fourth, uh, in the left side, uh, uh, it gives, it becomes part of the aortic ash itself. Uh, the fifth regresses during, uh, sorry, one second. Oh, sorry for interruption. Uh, so back to what I was saying, uh, the fourth uh, arch becomes uh, part of the aortic arch itself. Uh, fifth progresses during fetal life and uh, sixth uh, depends on the size, uh, side. So in the left side, it becomes uh, the left balloon artery and the ductus arteriosus. On the right side, it becomes the RBA. Okay, so now as for the types of the vas different vascular rings, <clears throat> uh, we have multiple times, uh, types. We'll try to discuss them one by one. Uh, first uh, is the double aortic arch. Uh, this is congenital malformation where you have uh, right and uh, left aortic arches uh, that are encircling both the trachea and esophagus. Uh, usually, this is due to the persistence of the uh, right and left aortic arches, uh, specifically of the fourth aortic arch. Uh, the posterior uh, arch, which is the right one, usually gives rise to the right common carotid and the right subclavian arch. Uh, and it is usually larger than the left, its left counterpart. The left arch gives uh, rise to the uh, left common carotid artery and the uh, left uh, subclavian artery. Uh, now the segment between the left uh, subclavian artery and the descending aorta can be atritic or patent. When it's patent, the size can be quite wide. Uh, the second uh, vascular ring, or uh, first, uh, there are many, many variants for the right aortic arch. Only one of them uh, can cause uh, lethal pathology that resembles vascular. This is the right aortic arch with anomalous left subclavian artery. <clears throat> Usually, uh, in this uh, arrangement, we will have the uh, left common carotid artery first, then uh, right common uh, carotid artery second, then right subclavian, and lastly, the uh, left subclavian. And the left step clavian will be attached to the bone artery with the ligament. Uh, and with this, we form the uh, full uh, vascular ring. Now, sometimes 
there is dilated segment uh, uh, on the left left uh, left subclavian where it arises from the uh, descending artery that is usually termed the reticulum of uh, Khmer. Uh, this whole pathology usually occurs when the forged arch regresses between the left common carotid artery and the left uh, subclavian artery. However, if it regresses after the left subclavian artery, uh, we'll have a right aortic arch with murder damage uh, branching. And this usually doesn't lead to symptoms of uh, vascular link. Another type is termed circumflex aorta. Uh, this is an, a right aortic arch with aberrant uh, uh, left uh, subclavian artery. Uh, and the left sided descending thoracic aorta with the left uh, ligament martyrism. I mentioned before that the right aortic arch usually uh, descends uh, to the right of the spine. However, sometimes we have uh, retroesophageal course of the arch itself, and uh, the, uh, the descending will uh, descend to the right of the uh, to the left of the spine. Uh, in these cases, you'll have this circumflex aorta, which can lead to uh, uh, compression. Another type is the pulmonary artery sling. This usually occurs when the LBA arises from the RBA uh, with the course of the anomalous uh, LBA coursing between, uh, from the left lung, coursing between the trachea and the esophagus. Uh, with its abnormal co uh, course, the LBA can cause extrinsic compression to the trachea and sometimes even to the right uh, main bronchus. Now, enormous artery compression syndrome, this is not a true vascular ring, however, it's a vascular malformation that may lead to uh, compression to the uh, bronchus. This usually occurs when the enormous artery uh, originates more leftward and posterior from the uh, from a left-sided aortic arch, it can usually lead to anterior uh, compression of the trachea. Uh, another, uh, uh, another potential uh, pathology that may lead to compression is the ductus link. Uh, usually when the uh, uh, ductus arteriosus arises from the RPA posteriorly and goes uh, posterior, posterior to the trachea and inserts into the uh, descending thoracic aorta. Uh, lastly, uh, if we have the anomalous right subclavian artery that is arising from the descending aorta and that causes in a retrospagial fashion, it can cause posterior compression of the esophagus. Um, but physiology, it's uh, very simple. Uh, just uh, uh, with the presence of all of these vascular rings, there, there is a potential for uh, extrinsic uh, compression. And that is the main culprit for all uh, the symptoms of the patients. Usually the symptoms um, present in two main ways, uh, either respiratory symptoms or uh, GI. For respiratory symptoms such as wheezes, uh, cough, stridor, or even recurrent infections. For GI symptoms, usually it's manifests in swallowing difficulties. Uh, of note, uh, uh, usually the symptoms are lesion dependent. Uh, the meaning of that that some lesions will be more likely to present with certain symptoms. Uh, for example, uh, in case of left aortic arch with a brand uh, right subclavian artery, the patient presents with dysphagia and. Uh, in other instances where you have double aortic arch or an ominous compression arch uh, syndrome or bulmary slings, usually these uh, are present with respiratory symptoms. The diagnosis, uh, it depends whether the patient is asymptomatic or symptomatic, found incidentally, or um, uh, in work up for patients that is presenting with, uh, for example, dysphagia or uh, unexplained wheezes. Uh, so in chest x-rays, if it's done, it may show some findings, uh, such as a right-sided aortic arch, or in this case, this is a patient who presents with hyperinflation of the uh, uh, right uh, lung due to uh, compression of the right main bronchus. 
the mainstay uh, for diagnosis uh, is uh, CT or MI, and this is the gold standard. And other uh, studies that may be used, uh, such as ECHO, uh, to check for accompanying cardiac anomalies if uh, present, uh, or bronchoscopy, and which is usually done to assess for airway pathology, namely uh, tracheomalacia or the presence of complete tracheal drinks. The mainstay of management of uh, the vascular rings is surgical management. Uh, and the rationale for that is because the symptoms are not going to improve without surgery. And uh, there is no medical management uh, as of now to treat uh, these symptoms. Uh, and usually the uh, surgical outcomes are excellent. And uh, the majority of the reverse can they can be done through a left uh, posterior lateral thoracotomy, except in a few cases where you need to do the other intracardiac anomalies or you have uh, some pathologies that are only amenable for the uh, through median stenotomy, such as uh, bulmonious link. Okay, so that's the end of the second part of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. If you have any question or feedback regarding the presentation, let me know. Any question from the audience? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we'll take a break for 10 minutes. Uh, we'll come back on 13.50 for our uh, second lecture. Uh,
دکتر رشد هم یس یس My slides are clear. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shadal Matlak, R3 cardiac surgery resident in King Faisal, uh, um, uh, King Faisal Hospital, Riyadh. I would like to welcome Dr. Farid Khogir, uh, consultant pediatric cardiac surgery. He will be my guest today. So my lecture about subaortic membrane. A uh, subaortic membrane is a form of, of uh, subvalvular aortic stenosis, is a fixed form of anatomic obstruction to aggress of uh, blood across the left ventricle outflow tract. Although classified as congenital uh, heart defect, it is uh, rarely at uh, birth and during infancy. It is a um, progressive course and its high rate of uh, post-operative uh, recurrence suggests that it may be an acquired condition. Associated uh, congenital heart defect uh, with uh, uh, subaortic membrane, it's around uh, uh, 25 to 50% of the patient with SAM. And the most common defect include uh, ventricular septal defect, Getting ductus arteriosus, cartication of aorta, bicuspid aortic valve, abnormal left ventricular papillary muscle, atrial ventricular septal defect, shown complex, and interrupted aortic arch and persistent uh, superior left vena cava. Epidemiology uh, subvalvular uh, aortic membrane account for approximately 1% of all congenital heart defect and for 15 to 20% of all fixed left ventricular outflow tract obstruction lesion. And the male to female ratio of SAM is two uh, to one, arranging to three to one. Isolated SAM is rarely seen at birth or during infancy. Uh, Exceptions include patients with shown complex and interrupted aortic arch who can have some in early infancy. Some may develop in some patients after they undergo repair of, um, of associated congenital heart defect. Uh, this picture, a picture showing uh, us uh, shown complex, which is a rare congenital cardiac malform malformation characterized by complex of four obstructive lesion of the left uh, heart, which is subvalvular mitral uh, membrane, SAM, and parachuting of mitral valve, and muscular me or membranous uh, subvalvular aortic stenosis and cortication of aorta. Here, the, uh, in this picture, this is cortication of aorta and subvalvular mitral ring, parachuting of mitral valve and subaortic membrane. The boundaries of the left vent, uh, ventricular outflow tract is, uh, for, are formed by posterior laterally by anterior leaflet of mitral valve and intervalvular fibrosa. This uh, section and anterior medially by muscular and membranous portion of the interventricular septum. Here. So the four basic anatomic variants are um, as following. One, thin disecret membrane consisted of endocardial fold and fibrous uh, tissue. Second form are fibromuscular ridge consisting of thickened membrane with muscular base at the crest of the interventricular septum. Three, a diffuse fibromuscular tunnel-like narrowing of the LVOT. For accessory or anatomy, uh, anomalous mitral valve tissue. Type 1 and 2 account for 70 to 80% of all cases of subaortic membrane and located um, 0.5 to 1.5 centimeter beneath the uh, aortic valve. Type 1 and 2 involve variable extent to the LVOT. 
Uh, but physiology, uh, they are clinically significant obstruction to ejection, uh, to ejection due to uh, subaortic membrane result in concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. Often with an excessive septal bulge, this effect lead to cyclic fourth uh, obstruction and localized fibromuscular growth. Heart failure usually results from associated congenital heart effect. Cardiac output is usually well maintained and systolic function is well preserved in children with isolated SAM until severe obstruction develop. Thickened of the aortic valve and dilation of the ascending aorta may be due to repetitive trauma and vibration from high velocity jet of blood flow through the uh, site of the stenosis. Aortic regurgitation developed in nearly 65% of the patient in a uh, course of SAM and is usually per, uh, uh, persist uh, even after the SAM is removed. Aortic regurgitation adds volume overload to the already pressured overloaded LV that will lead to decreased aortic diastolic pressure, lead to diminished coronary perfusion and in combination with increased lift ventricular oxygen demand, from the pressure and volume overload, predispose the left ventricle uh, myocardium to ischemic injury. The etiology of SAM still is not fully understood. Fixed SAM may be uh, uh, the uh, postnatal expression of the latent congenital lesion brought out by many mechanisms such as genetic predisposition, a curtain anatomic characteristic of LVOT, hemodynamic abnormalities. But there is no gene, a genetic inheritance is known for some and few familial incidents are uh, reported. LVOT morphology may be inherently increased fluid shear stress on the interventricular septum and induce abnormal endothelial and muscular uh, proliferation uh, uh, response uh, in out flow tract with eventual formation of fibromuscular ring. Symptoms of SAM are rare in infancy and uncommon in early childhood, even, um, even if uh, the stenosis is severe. The diagnosis is frequently made during an evaluation for an asymptomatic heart um, murmur. When present, symptoms include dyspnea on exertion, Syncope, syncope, pre syncope, angina, orthopnea, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death. On physical examination, uh, the physical growth of the child with SAM is usually normal, and prominent A wave in jugular venous pulse occasionally occur in SAM. This wave reflects the reduced RV compliance consequence to the hypertrophied ventricular septum. A palpable carotid thrill and left parasternal thrill are present in one third of the patient with SAM. And low pitched uh, ejection systolic murmur is best appreciated in second and third left parasternal space. The, uh, the length of the murmur is uh, proportional to the degree of the obstruction. Workup, starting with echocardiography uh, with color Doppler, Doppler imaging is the current modality of choice to establish the diagnosis of SAM. Here we can see this is long axis, uh, uh, parasternal uh, uh, echocardiography showing here, this is the aortic valve and this is the membrane uh, in the LVOT. Cardiac catheterization is not uh, routinely indicated in isolated SAM, but can be utilized for preoperative hemodynamic evaluation when associated with other congenital heart defect. Also here we can see clearly there is a tunnel type of uh, SAM. ECG and subaortic um, uh, stenosis, even uh, if it's mild, ECG reveal a variable degree of left ventricular hypertrophy around 50 to 80% of the patient and prominent Q wave in the left precordial lead may be present, present for, uh, from the septal hypertrophy and there also be strain uh, pattern and, um, on the ECG in approximately 25% of the patient 
uh, that will indicate severe obstruction. Here we have an ECG with patient uh, having some. We have lift axis deviation. Um, and also we have inverted T wave in AVL that uh, indicates strain pattern. MRI also can be used to, uh, uh, to diagnose the SAM. Here, this is imaging with MRI showing clearly this is a SAM subaortic membrane. The hysterical finding of the membrane, it's uh, abundant amount of irregularity oriented and dense collagen fiber and thin short elastic fiber are uh, visible. And also there is scattered fibroblast with elongated nuclei and smooth muscle cell. And also there is vascularity is generally absent. This is the subaortic membrane and this is ventricular septum. And um, this is the fibrous tissue. Most uh, pediatric patients with subaortic membrane are asymptomatic. Uh, therefore, medical therapy has no role for, the, uh, for such a patient. Such intervention is currently undertaken before heart failure is developed. If SAM progressed to the point of that heart failure, standard medical therapy except the use of uh, systemic vasodilator such as ACE inhibitor as indicated and, uh, and until surgery can be performed. So what's the indication for intervention? Uh, the based on the published data on approach to management of SAM after risk benefit uh, stratification is, uh, if uh, there is no intervention and medication, medical uh, follow-up in patients and child with um, child and adolescents with Doppler mean gradient less than 30 millimercury, and there is no left ventricular hypertrophy, and uh, there is a surgical indication for a child uh, for children and adolescents with Doppler mean gradient of 50 or or more, or children and adolescents with Doppler mean gradient 30 to 50 with symptomatic angina, syncope, or dyspnea on exertion. It's class one indication for surgery. And uh, if the child and or adolescents with Doppler mean gradient 30 to 50, um, if, they ha if they are asymptomatic but develop ST and T wave changes over the left pericardium on ECG, it is a class one indication for surgical intervention. Uh, so prevention of aortic regurgitation, regurgitation is usually not an indication for surgical intervention in those with mild left ventricular outflow out tract obstruction. Uh, inter interventional procedure, percutaneous balloon dilation of dissected subvalvular aortic stenosis has been infrequently reported as a successful in reducing the left ventricular outflow tract pressure gradient. And the surgery of uh, choice for dissected fibromuscular SAM is complete resection with myotomy, with or without myomectomy through an uh, aortotomy. And patients with a clinical significant aortic regurgitation may require aortic valve repair or replacement. So we'll have a video about uh, the surgery, how to do SAM resection. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Mustafa Janil, uh, one of the surgeons in uh, Apollo Children's Hospital. Today we are uh, presenting a seven-year-old male uh, who are presented with congenital dysplastic aortic valve with severe AS and uh, mild to moderate AR. You can see the echo there showing a severe uh, subvalvar uh, crowding. The peak gradient was around uh, 57, uh, around 85, and um, uh, mean gradient of around 50. You can see the color Doppler there. That's the gradient. So he was uh, taken up for uh, surgery, went on iota and RA cannulation, cross clamped, um, cardioplegia given uh, through the root. 
and uh, iototomy is on progress we generally like to do uh, a full iototomy in these cases which uh, we think it helps us in a better identify subvalvar pathology most of the subaortic stenosis uh, we approach through the iota in some cases uh, we approach it even through the mitral valve through the uh, leaflet uh, but in this we thought the pathology was uh, right uh, uh, under the aortic valve and uh, three sutures were uh, used to at the commissures to keep the aorta open and uh, sutures were taken at the nodules of Ferrandi on all three leaflets to the, keep the leaflets away. And what you see there is the right coronary cusp. And you can see that uh, the scarring or the, uh, the subaortic that fibrous tissue is very close to the nadir of the RCC. So just doing a couple of uh, re-checking again and again uh, so that we don't go into the RCC. At the same same time, it's very important to release the RCC uh, from that fibrous thing because uh, the tethering of the valve is the reason for the AR. So the uh, removal of the tissue is from the nadir of the RCC towards the LCC. By uh, if you go towards the NCC, there is uh, more chance of hard block between the RCC and the NCC. Uh, there's more chance of injuring the AV nodal tissue. So, again, uh, with the forceps uh, checking it, uh, we are not injuring the RCC. Very important to do uh, it. Uh, reasonably bold cut to remarking this fibrous tissue because any inadequate recession will give you residual uh, subaortic stenosis. So most of the tissue has been removed now. So it's mainly removed from, from the RCC towards the LCC. When you get closer to the LCC, you have to watchful that you're not encroaching onto the anterior mitral leaflet. A little bit of a myectomy. By pressing on the RVOT with the finger, you can uh, make that uh, uh, that area more visible and more, uh, uh, which makes it easier to so, excise that part. We generally use a uh, eleven blade to excise it, and right now just checking with the HECAR size uh, eleven, twelve, and uh, thirteen. The expected aortic size is around uh, 13 here. So 11 and 12 is going uh, fairly easily. Uh, 13, there is a slight uh, this thing. So we thought we'll do a little bit more resection. So that is now going slightly towards the RCC, NCC area, but uh, making sure we are not going into the, up to the nadir of the NCC where there is a chance for a heart block. So little bit, little bit for this resection, excision of the tissue. Yeah. So just checking the all leaflet, that's the LCC, that's fine. That's the RCC, that looks fine. That's the NCC, it looks fine. And all leaflets uh, look uh, finely coapting. Putting a little bit uh, saline to see if there's any, any, le any leak. The valve looks fine now. The autotomy is closed in the usual manner. And that's the post -op echo. You can see nice uh, laminar flow there. There's uh, no LVOT looks nicely opened up. There's no stenosis. And um, thankfully, there's no AR as well. So post -op, there's no significant ASA. So this is my references, uh, these two articles and uh, from uh, this book, Cardiothoracic Surgery, Export. And thank you. Any question or comment?
Uh, Dr. Farid, any question or comment about the presentation? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Um I don't know if you want me to ask you uh, as a presenter or you want me to ask any other colleagues. I'll tell you what, I will ask you, and if you uh, you can ask for help from either uh, some of your uh, junior uh, uh, colleagues or some of your seniors, depend on how you think about the question. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so uh, sir, let's start first with the video, please. Um, um, I would like you to stop at the last part of that video. So shall I share it again? Yes, please. Okay. Can you stop it uh, or you can't? Yes, I can. Just a minute. Okay, okay. go toward the, uh, open it and go toward the last part we talked about. Yeah, here, I know. At the last part when he talked about the uh, audit valve, yeah, showing the echo. Go, go ahead and show the post-operative echo. Okay. And that's the post-operative echo. You can see stop, nice. Stop, stop there, please. Um, so um, if you can just uh, take one uh, forward, one uh, step. Oh. This is, okay, stop please. Uh, can you? Can you just click rather than moving, okay? Just click, okay? Just like this, perfect. Stop there, please. What, okay. do, you, what do you think about the function of the aortic valve here? Well, I think there is my regurgitation of aortic valve. Yes, that's correct. And actually he said there's no regurgitation, right? Yeah. So he he did not. He did not really um, comment on this regurg. Uh, so coming back to this question now, the patient, this patient, have regurgitation before surgery. Uh, what do you expect after you remove the SAM if it uh, if it was involved or encroaching onto the leaflet? What do you expect to happen to the uh, aortic regurg? Could be increased or the, still the same, but I think it will not be improved. Actually, uh, um, okay. <laughs> many times it is improved, many times, because now the leaflet is more free to move and uh, the, um, the regurgitation will be less. Um, but let's say, uh, let's say the regurgitation was significant. It was not mild, um, it was moderately severe. Um, is there anything else you should do in this case? Well, can we uh, consider aortic repair, aortic valve repair or replacement? Uh, okay, replacement will be a little bit too aggressive, especially in, in uh, regarding our uh, children. But then if you have to, of course you have to. Um, uh, repair is, um, is the way to go. Um, if you have, uh, especially if you have residual regurgitation, more than uh, moderate or more, then you have to consider uh, going back and repairing it. Uh, but remember this, many times if the valve was involved with the, uh, with the leaflet, uh, having uh, part of the membrane creeping up on those leaflets, uh, usually it have better excursion and it will co-opt uh, better and therefore the regurgitation will be less. Now that leads us to one question is what are the, um, what is the risk of reoperation of those patients in SAM resection? Mm. I don't know actually. So I ask uh, for help from uh, one of your seniors. I, I, I don't know who's there, but you, you probably know them. Go ahead and ask somebody to help you. I hope see. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Deb. Um, yeah, hi, Richard. Uh, probably 20 30 percent risk of reoperation. Uh, I'm sorry, I did, uh, the reoperation is what again? 20 to 30 percent, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, actually, um, in, the, in the adult patients or uh, more the adolescent to the adult patients, it's reported around 25 percent. But for the younger uh, uh, patients, it's maybe less um, or around somewhere around 15%. Uh, uh, but actually that number have decreased dramatically in our hands um, and many people 
Um, we had a visitor called uh, Raja Mee. Uh, you probably all know him. He's a very famous uh, um, pediatric cardiac surgeon. And during his visit, he told us uh, in the 90s, 91, I think, uh, he told us that if you resect the muscle, do myomectomy, the incidence of re recurrence will drop significantly. At that time, our re recurrence rate was 14%, and nowadays it's somewhere around 2 to 3%. So that's something to keep in mind. Doing um, a good myomectomy is, is, uh, will reduce your uh, uh, reoperation re rate. But what other factors are you aware of that can potentiate reoperation on those patients? Recurrence of membrane or um, development of uh, aortic regurgitation? Continue, Abdullah. Uh, younger age at operation, usually the higher risk. And uh, if there is a AR uh, to start with, Initially, usually it's a risk factor for uh, development of uh, AR in the future, even if it's uh, low. Yes, those are two factors are important, but also additional things to that is the location of the membrane. If it's less than uh, half a centimeter uh, closer to the annulus, or if there's a, a creeping part of the membrane on, on the leaflet, and if you feel, um, uh, for those who attended surgery, they can see us sometimes, uh, how do we milk it out of the uh, leaflet itself? Um, one more comment about the surgery here, um, uh, um, Shada, they have used 11 blade. Um, our experience is much better with uh, blunt dissection for most of the time, and rarely we use sharp dissection. Um, okay, uh, another question to you, Shada, and you may want to ask for help. Let's say I did myomectomy and the myomectomy was a little bit too deep. What can happen with that? Well, it can cause um, a VSD. Okay, how would I know if I developed VSD at the time of surgery? Maybe in the echo. If the echo is, it means already too late that the patient is off bypass and I'm doing the echo now to look at it, which means I have to go back on bypass to check for the VSD. Is there a way I can know earlier at the time when I uh, did the myomectomy? You can um, inject um, a saline to Where? in the right atrium. So um, tell me about the setup of the bypass you use for Sam. I have a bicaval uh, cannulation. Okay. Um, uh, one uh, uh, opening through the right atrium to the SPC and one uh, cannula going to IVC. Okay. This is the venous cannula and uh, uh, so, okay, so uh, do you use the snares or you, you just leave it open? You use um, the snares for the uh, for the venous yes. cannula? Yes, we use the snare. If you use the snares, what will happen to the cardioplegia that you're injecting into uh, the patient's root at the time of giving the cardioplegia? Where would it go? To go, it will go to. Uh, if we use the uh, snare, it will go to the uh, the coronary sinus. And then to the um, right atrium. How much do you give uh, uh, volume for cardioplegia? Well, for pediatric, I don't know actually. But for uh, adult, like. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, formula. Approximate? 25 ml to 50. Maybe. Okay, uh, we usually give quite a bit. So per kilo, you may mean, mean per kilo. So it will be around a liter maybe. Will the right atrium take one liter? Uh, no. So where would it go? So go to the... Left ventricle. 
uh, right ventricle, sorry. Okay, and then? Pulmonary artery. Would it go that far? Of course, if you have high pressures and high volume, but most likely we don't put the snares down and we take it, we allow it to go, drain into the uh, venous cannula. And we put the drain just before we open the right atrium if we have to open it. And let's say in this case, you wanted to keep the patient uh, heart cold. Uh, so you'll be having better uh, myocardial preservation. After you give the cardioplegia, now you snare the, uh, the, uh, the uh, now you snare the right atrium. So tell me now, how can I discover that VSD? We can um, uh, unsnare the right, uh, the SVC cannula. Okay. And uh, we uh, clamp it and we see if there clamp is- Clamp what? Clamp what? The SVC. Um, SVC, uh, if you clamp it, what will happen to the blood? Where is it gonna go? Go to the right atrium. Wait a minute, you're clamping the SVC or you're clamping the SVC cannula? Cannula, sorry. The SVC cannula. We okay. clamp the cannula and we'll see if uh, right. the, the blood now, the blood is filling the heart and you tell the uh, perfusionist that you communicate well with the perfusionist that you are clamping. So they would make sure that they don't lose too much volume and they uh, do not reach uh, air embolism levels, right? So now the right atrium is full of blood, and then? Uh, the blood will go to the right ventricle and we'll see if there is um, uh, uh, blood going uh, uh, from uh, RV to LV. From, from where, I'm sorry? RV, did you say RV? Yes. Okay. All right, that's, that's, very good. that's very good understanding for the hemodynamics, and I'm uh, sorry for the uh, uh, pathology. And you're right, uh, if you happen to do that, then you don't have to wait until you come off bypass and do the echo and repair. How would you repair that VSD? Uh, can we use a batch to repair the VSD if it's, if it's uh, big? Or we can uh, do direct suturing? Okay, that's most likely uh, the case, but uh, of course it depends on the size and it depends on the location. Usually if it's a myomectomy uh, of the subvalvular, we go for about um, resecting part of the muscle or just uh, doing a myomat myomectomy uh, um, in the area. So um, it will be like a slit like that you probably can uh, suture uh, directly. Mm -hmm. And usually it's a small size, hopefully, you are not too aggressive with the myocardium. And the level of depth that you take from the myocardium is, is reasonable, usually about two or three millimeters in children, um, you go into the septum. It will allow you, especially with patients who have hypertrophied LV. Okay, um, what, what's the anatomy of the, um, you may wanna ask one of the juniors here, what's the anatomy of the conduction tissue uh, in relation to the SAM? Just name, are you there? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, what's the anatomy of the conduction of tissue to the sun? Um. It's uh, the one that has it near, but I'm not sure if there is any uh, conductive tissue in the area. He kept mentioning that in the in the video. Uh, you should know about this uh, by now, uh, Tasneem. Uh, I'm sure somebody else is aware of this, especially if the, the senior guys are aware of that. What about uh, Chada? What about the membranous septum? Where is it located in relation to the SAM? Uh, it's anterior, anterior medial uh, aspect. So in, in usually we, dis, we describe that in relation to the cusp. So which cusp is it associated with, was closest to that? That's... Um... 
uh, between the right and uh, none. Correct. And if you remove the SAM there, you may be a little bit more aggressive and you may create also um, uh, the BSD there uh, in relation to the membrane septum. And the, uh, it could be a VSD or it could be uh, uh, direct communication to the atrium, to the right, to the right atrium. All right, can you show me the first slide in, in your presentation, uh, some of the first slides that you have? Okay, um, yeah. Um, next, please. Next. Okay. You said here it may be, no, stop there. It may be an yes. acquired condition, right? Yes. Uh, in another slide, you said it may be genetics. Do you remember yeah, but, that? Yeah, but there is no specific genes found for, uh, for some. Okay. So, uh, but it doesn't mean if there's no genes found, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Yes. So there may still be uh, um, a gene that will be discovered maybe by you or one of your colleagues will discover that. What, may, what should make us think that there must be a gene involved? For the inheritance of the son. How is it inherited? Actually, I, um, when I read, there is rarely inheritance through the generation. So uh, could be you know, like aortic uh, uh, autosomal uh, recessive, not a dominant you know, gene. Okay, so there is, there is actually uh, many uh, reports of familial uh, transmission, which uh, goes very well with the recessive, or it could be the dominant with variable uh, uh, um, transmission. Um, but in, uh, in the animals, in, in, in one type of dogs, it has been found to be uh, autosomal dominant transmission. So, uh, and that's definitely is genetics, though they have not identified the gene that is associated with it. Um, there's something else that should uh, think, should make us also think it must be genetics. What else in your presentation? that um, give us a hint that it may be genetic. A shown complex. Okay, shown complex, what else? And the association with other uh, congenital heart disease. Okay, what else? Um, it's uh, more in, uh, in uh, uh, female than male. I is it? Is it more in female or more in males? More in males, sorry. Are you sure? <laughs> Show us the slide, please. But anyway, no, that's, no, that's, no. that's 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 more the, in the, female. More in female or is it more in males? More in males. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So that's actually one of the strongest argument um, in your presentation that goes with a potential uh, association with uh, genetics. Okay, I have another uh, um, question, let me see here. Um, okay, yeah, endocarditis. Have you, did you mention anything about endocarditis with the uh, son? No, I didn't. Uh, is there any uh, concern about endocarditis in this disease? Any congenital heart disease could be associated with endocarditis because there is abnormal tissue. So it's... Uh, not, only, not only abnormal tissue, but the trauma that happens from the jet uh, is also very important. So yes, there is an association of this disease with endocarditis, especially in... Uh, in um, in an adult patient. So the, the years of, of injury is in, important. And the, uh, the instance have been reported to be somewhere around 15 to 17%, according to uh, uh, one of the references in Kirkland. So, uh, and that's one of the concerns that if you have uh, significant stenosis with a jet uh, lesion, then um, people will think that, uh, 
we maybe we should operate on that. With the, the, just like I said, the, the indication, the soft indications are not really well settled. And uh, in our practice, if the patient have uh, even mild uh, AR and um, it's progressive and the uh, patient is uh, younger, we tend to operate on those uh, patients. And we think at one time we were very aggressive, even without any of these, we were just seeing a SAM is uh, immediately mean surgery, but that have changed over the last uh, 30, 40 years. And now we are more toward uh, selective, but, um, um, but at the same time, a little bit more aggressive than others in, in treating SAM. Okay, well, that's all I have uh, uh, for you. Uh, you need to read uh, more about the uh, pathology uh, and the pathology specimen itself. Uh, and if you have seen, we do a lot of SAM in our institute. So uh, one day just uh, take yourself uh, to the cat, to the lab, I mean, to the uh, pathology lab and have a look at the, uh, at the SAM. What do you expect to see on the, in the uh, histology? Uh, fibromuscular tissue. Okay, and, and many times in our hands, it's usually just fibrous uh, tissue because we don't resect uh, the muscle except doing after we remove the SAM, um, we, we do the myomectomy uh, in a specific area. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's the questions I have in the comments. And if any of the group or any of the co your colleagues have any questions or comments, I will be more glad, uh, more than happy to help you answer those. Well, thank you, Dr. Farid. Any, other, any question from the audience to Dr. Farid? Seems there is no questions or comment. Thank you, Dr. Farid, again. Thank you, Dr. Farid, and thank you, Dr. Shadab, for uh, the presentation. Inshallah, we'll uh, join for the last session at 14.45.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Welcome back Today I'll be with you um, talking about surgery for adult congenital uh, heart disease So inshallah we'll go through a small introduction and we'll talk about the common surgical operation done for patients with adult congenital heart disease. So congenital heart disease in adult defined as the presence of unrepaired or repaired congenital heart disease in patient aged uh, 21 years or older. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, physical and emotional maturity is variable. So the distinction between the adult and non-adult is unclear. That's why in practice, the designation adult entails uh, provision of uh, specific methods of care giving best delivered uh, in adult care environment. That's why the process of transitioning a patient, a young patient successfully to an adult health care environment should uh, begin by age of 12 years. Congenital heart disease in adults can be categorized in different ways. If we try with primary versus secondary, the primary congenital heart disease uh, is previously, usually previously untreated anomalies that relatively benign pathophysiologic disturbance, which allow survival to uh, adulthood without treatment. And the primary uh, congenital heart disease in adults is less common than secondary. The secondary congenital heart disease uh, usually the patient with, uh, in patients with previously uh, treated congenital heart disease and more common in adult uh, than primary congenital heart disease. Uh, it covers the entire spectrum of congenital heart disease. Newly diagnosed versus previously diagnosed uh, anomalies. The newly diagnosed anomalies is either anomalies that are uh, sufficiently benign to escape detection, uh, detection uh, include uh, those causing left to right chunk like ASD, partial AVSD, uh, restrictive VSDs, and restrictive uh, PDA, or those causing uh, minor valvular uh, obstruction or gravitation as bicuspid optic valve. The other examples of newly diagnosed anomalies is anomalies with pathophysiologic changes, but allow, uh, allowing survival uh, to adulthood, like left to right chunk lesions with serious, hemo with serious hemodynamic disturbance as large, uh, less restrictive VSD, um, the, or selective cases of cyanotic uh, lesions like the surgery of fallot and pulmonary stenosis. For previously diagnosed anomalies, it's either benign asymptomatic pathophysiology that left it untreated as those uh, progress uh, in adulthood, uh, for example, by cuspid aortic valve, or those uh, complicated in adulthood, for example, uh, restrictive uh, VSD with uh, that complicated with endocarditis. Uh, or other uh, previously diagnosed anomalies is anomalies thought to be inoperable uh, as complex uh, non-life threatening uh, as complex non-life threatening lesions uh, being managed without surgical correction or a new surgical approach have become available, uh, for example, for pulmonary atresia VSD or uh, orthopulmonary collaterals with mild uh, cyanosis. So these patients uh, can be a candidate for unipicalization or intracardiac repair as an adult.
<coughs> so the prevalence, the level of development of uh, the the level of development of healthcare uh, strongly influenced the prevalence and profile of adult congenital heart uh, disease patient. So since 1970s, more than 80% of patients with congenital heart disease have survived into adult uh, life. Survival does not necessarily mean cure, as uh, a cure uh, is usually best defined as the states uh, that result when survival and quality of life are equal or indistinguishable from uh, normal. Approximately 800,000 uh, adults in the US have uh, congenital heart disease. This table uh, represents the distribution of different uh, adult congenital heart disease and uh, it shows the different or uh, if the intervention or surgery is first done in adulthood or uh, uh, it is a reoperation of previously uh, repaired uh, anomalies. As we see here in first surgery in adulthood, the most common is ASD. And in reoperation, the most common type is uh, tough patient. Now we'll move to the next and important part in surgical intervention for adult congenital heart disease, which is the reoperation. Reoperation is frequent in patients with adult congenital heart disease, almost. Uh, one third of patients with adult congenital uh, operations are redo surgeries. Uh, risk factors uh, risk factors for reoperation, sternotomy injury in adult congenital heart disease patients are different from those in patients with acquired heart disease. And usually the risk factors include uh, retrosternal ventricular to pulmonary uh, artery conduits, uh, particularly if they are calcified or multiply stented. And pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular enlargement, prior sternal infections, or our two pulmonary shots. Femoral cannulation is often difficult in uh, patients with adult congenital heart disease, as uh, usually they have they undergo multiple intervention, uh, interventional catheterization through uh, their uh, growth years, and resulting in stenotic or uh, occluded femoral vessels. So precautions to minimize the risk of Reoperative sternotomy is to the preoperative planning with alternative risk predicted steps, cautery dissection or avoid sharp dissection, carbon dioxide continuously infused into the field, the placement of anti adhesant, uh, anti adhesion materials to decrease adhesion to the sternum in cases with highly suspected to have uh, reoperation. We'll talk about the frequent lesions in patients with adult congenital heart disease by dividing them into two categories. The first one is the shunt lesions. So ASD is one of the most common congenital anomalies found in adults. It represents 30% of newly diagnosed congenital heart disease in adults, but also it may present as uh, repaired or non-repaired previously diagnosed lesion. Most commonly is present with, uh, uh, almost in one third of patients is present with other associated cardiac defects, for example, mitral prolapse, uh, options for ASD uh, closure include um, surgical repair or percutaneous. 
ये तो आज क्लोज है Basic Chinese device closure is the standard approach for patient uh, for patient from an ovary and most uh, secondum ASTs. Basic Chinese device closure of secondum ASTs can be performed in adults regardless of the age. Surgical approach is available to repair sinus venosus AST, primum uh, septum uh, defects. Secondum defects uh, that's non closable by devices. Early mortality rate for AST surgical AST closure in adult is less than 1%. AST <coughs> are repaired on cardiopulmonary bypass with ischemic arrest. Media sternosomy is the standard approach. Other uh, common approaches for adulthood AST repair became more common to uh, improve the cosmetic results, like uh, partial upper and lower sternotomy or trans uh, xiphoid, anterior thoracotomy, submammary incisions. Indications for AST closure. Continuing the follow-up for patient, uh, asymptomatic patient with unrepaired ASD with uh, ASDs of five millimeter or less. The closure regardless of ASD size is indicated if there is a paradoxical embolization, onset of atrial arrhythmia or concomitant surgical procedures is being performed. ASD should be closed regardless to symptoms if associated with right side enlargement or bad uh, function or a significant left to right chart. More QPQS more than 1.5 uh, to 1. <clears throat> Pulmonary artery hypertension may be a uh, uh, contraindication for ASD closure if the PA pressure more than two thirds systemic or sminger physiology is present. Congenital ventricular septal defect rarely present for surgical closure in adult. It's present as previously diagnosed primary disease with uh, benign physiology or with the, uh, with the new development of a specific VST related complication requiring intervention. For example, tricuspid regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, or complicated by infected endocarditis. Infected endocarditis. The VST closure, percutaneous VST device closure may be used for selected muscular VSTs uh, that remote from uh, ventricular inlet or outlet. Uh, surgical techniques are similar to those in, used in children. Early mortality for surgical VST closure in adult for uncomplicated VST is less than 1% but reach five to 10% if complicated VST or uh, pulmonary vascular diseases coexist. Indication for VST closure, indication uh, are the same whether the VST is primary or a residual uh, defect from previous repair. VST should be closed if left ventricular volume overload, hemodynamically uh, significant chance, or cardiac catheterization demonstrates reversible uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. Surgical closure of VST is reasonable in adults when there is a worsening aortic uh, regurgitation. Uh, caused by VST. Uh, closure is contraindicated if there is a fixed resistance, uh, severe uh, pulmonary hypertension, or is major physiology present. The third lesion and shunting lesion is fatal ductus arteriosus, which is rare in adult. It's almost always present as newly diagnosed primary disease. 
surgery is really indicated for uh, rarely indicated for ETA in adults as most cases are closed percutaneously with coil or other uh, closed device. Closed device PDA in uh, adult may be found to be uh, short aneurysm or calcified. So the surgical closure of PDA can be performed either via median sternotomy or left thoracotomy. Uh, simple ligation and division, and division is performed for non-complicated PDA. But uh, cardiopulmonary bypass is needed for internal batch closure technique for ductal uh, orifice through the pulmonary trunk in cases with uh, complicated PDA. The indication for PDA closure in adult surgery is indicated for uh, any PDA that cannot be closed percutaneously and causes uh, shunt-related symptoms, shunt-related cardiac enlargement, or pulmonary hypertension. In contrast to infant and children, adults requiring surgery for intracardiac problems who have coexisting a PDA, they should have PDA closed percutaneously prior to cardiac operation. As major physiology are, is a contraindication for PDA closure. The second category and uh, of frequent uh, lesions in patients with adult uh, congenital heart disease, our presentation is the flow disturbing lesions. For example, we have Epstein anomalies. Epstein anomaly in adult is uncommon. Only 10% of patients will present for the first time in adulthood. Surgery for uh, Epstein anomaly can be performed in older patients at low risk with good rate outcome. <clears throat> Surgery in adult with unrepaired Epstein anomaly may be may include the following uh, core procedures in uh, various uh, combinations: a tricuspid valve replacement or uh, repair or replacement, closure of atrial septal defect, right atrial reduction plasty, and uh, surgery for arrhythmias. Cone technique uh, provide a good result in adult patient. Uh, in cone technique, the, the steps is to this, the section of the anterior and posterior tricuspid leaflet from their RV attachment, then rotated and sutured to the septal leaflet borders. This uh, produce a cone shaped uh, valve which is fixed distally at the right ventricle uh, apex and proximally at the tricuspid valve animus. Surgical intervention is indicated in uh, adult patient with cyanosis or uh, reduced functional capacity. The relative indication in asymptomatic patient include the progressive cardio uh, Migally due to tricuspid regurgitation, rise atrial and ventricular enlargement, uh, and the new onset of uh, atrial arrhythmias. So, progressive cardiomyopathy due to tricuspid regurgitation, or right atrial and ventricular enlargement, or onset of uh, new onset of atrial arrhythmias. The primary cause of death for adult patients with cyanotic uh, lesion usually is arrhythmia, and the first one is arrhythmia, and the second is followed by heart failure. 
So from time patient in adulthood may present with arrhythmia, systemic ventricular failure, systemic venous pathway obstruction, semilunar or uh, atrioventricular valve dysfunction. Fontan circulation each have characteristic complications. Uh, complicated intracardiac buffels in patients who present with uh, extreme uh, right atrial enlargement, uh, stagnant flow, right pulmonary veins compression, or arrhythmias may be converted to extracardiac content. The valve replacements are often required as uh, Repair are often complex and contained patient. In extracardiac contain, catheterization produces procedures that requiring atrial level intervention is not easily uh, accessed as uh, their systemic vein, uh, veins are excluded from the heart. Um, so as adult congenital heart disease patient has unpredicted predictable anatomy of uh, conduction tissue so that it, that results in frequent uh, frequent need for pacemaker uh, insertion so uh, routine uh, placement of dual chamber uh, anti-tachycardia pacemaker in patients undergoing poor fontan division is uh, recommended uh, retro aortic pulmonary arteries uh, Archie stenosis can be uh, stented. <clears throat> Fontan revision, including arrhythmia surgery, is reasonable for adult uh, with Fontan uh, who has uh, recurrent atrial arrhythmias and severe atrial uh, dilatation. Uh, Reoperation. For, or intervention may be considered for structural anatomical, uh, structural anatomic abnormalities or failure of fontan circulation in asymptomatic patients. Many successful neonatal or infant uh, repair are uh, returning with pulmonary insufficiency. Uh, uh, or stenosis in adulthood. The need for RBOT reconstruction is more common after previously repaired uh, tetralogy of a load, double outlet, uh, right ventricle, pulmonary atresia, truncus arteriosus, or uh, arterial switch procedures. Percutaneous pulmonary uh, valve implantation was introduced uh, and performed uh, in 2000. Uh, it became increase, uh, increasingly available as clinical trials have demonstrated safety and efficacy. Uh, evident uh, to result in improvement in New York uh, uh, Heart Association functional classes at one month post procedure. Surgical RBOT reconstruction for patient uh, who's not amenable to transcatheter for transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation. Uh, need a redo uh, median sternotomy uh, and it's a, on cardiopulmonary bypass with moderate hypothermia may be performed without ischemic arrest, uh, but we need to control the branch the pulmonary arches. Options for uh, pulmonary valve replacement include pulmonary and aortic homographs, bovine uh, jugular vein grafts, which have significantly less failure, dysfunction, and uh, uh, failure rate than pulmonary homograph. Uh, Bioprosthetic or mechanical valves. Uh, which also is a good choice uh, in patients with normal pulmonary valve annulus and normal right ventricular anatomy.
advanced uh, advantage and disadvantage exist for uh, each options. The homograph and bovine jugular veins have a length, so it can be used uh, uh, to span long uh, gaps between uh, the right ventricle and the branch pulmonary arteries. The vibrosthetic uh, valves have a rigid rings, which provide a stable landing zone for uh, transcatheter valves. Surgical or percutaneous intervention for patient with moderate or greater uh, pulmonary regurgitation or stenosis uh, in previous RBOT uh, intervention is indicated in symptomatic patient, is reasonable for patient with reduced function, functional capacity or uh, arrhythmia, and may be reasonable for asymptomatic patient but with severe pathology and reduced RV uh, ejection fraction or RV dilatation or with IV, the RV dilatation. Isolated uh, LVOT obstruction is less common in patients with adult congenital heart disease than those with acquired left-sided lesions. The acquired uh, adult congenital uh, heart disease patient with LVOT obstruction must be evaluated for upstream and downstream uh, stenosis. Uh, options for LVOT reconstruction include ROS, uh, ROS cono and cono procedures. Problems related to uh, cortic coarctation are relatively common among adults with congenital heart disease. It's often present as a recurrence coarctation in patients who had surgical intervention as infant or child. Uh, intervention may be surgical or percutaneous catheter based therapy. Primary and recurrent uh, coarctation of the aorta in adult patient is increasingly stented uh, percutaneously. So when transcatheter therapy is not feasible, uh, three options for surgical uh, repair can be used. Either coarctation resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis, patch enlargement with tissue or uh, prosthetic patch. Uh, third option is the synthetic uh, tube uh, interposition. Uh, Indication for uh, intervention uh, include a gradient uh, of 20 millimeter mercury or more, aluminum narrowing of 50% or more, uh, MRI detected important collateral uh, flow. Uh, balloon angioplasty is considerable choice if both stent and surgical intervention are uh, out of choices. Thank you. Any question from the audience? It's a Farid and Any question or comment? Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. Okay, thank you. By this, we conclude our session for today. Uh, thank you. See you, inshallah, next week. <laughs>